Hey everybody, Kestova back um, with another tips and tricks for you on the steel construction manual, um, AASC steel manual. So before we talked about um, a couple of tips that I use in my everyday professional life. I mean, if you take a look at this book, um, it's massive. And actually now um, from last year, the 15th edition came out. It's like a teal uh, cover. And you can see the red cover, 14th edition. A um, couple of changes in there, but nothing too drastic. Um, I still have mine from college, and these are pretty expensive. So, um, and actually, you can you can keep using the 14th edition in design practice for a couple more years. So, um, this is definitely still going to be beneficial. A lot of what's in here, almost all of what's in here, is in the same place in the new manual. So. Um, don't worry if you have the blue one, they're, they're almost exact. So let's get into it. And if they're not on the same pages, um, in, a, in the 15th edition, the blue one, um, if I can at least show you the tables and areas that I go to, it'll definitely be in your manual and you might just have to flip through a couple of pages to find them out. So, um, still good information. Uh, let's get into it. So last time we started kind of towards the beginning talking about our material grades, we're going to skip by that now. Um, I'm going to take you to um, the section modulus uh, section of the book for W shapes. Um, so this is a quick tabulated uh, section that you can flip to for very quick um, capacities of W shapes. Um, and actually, it's their, their plastic um, capacity. Um, so that's, that's basically like the maximum capacity that you're going to get um, from your W section. Um, Plastic, meaning that you get to use your, your Z um, section modulus as opposed to an elastic section, which is your S sub X. Um, but we'll, we'll go into that with some examples in uh, some videos later down the road. Um, but for the meantime, if you're just running some really quick numbers and trying to initially get some steel sizes, flip open to this table. Um, and they have, as you can see, both um, quantities for ASD and LRFD, so that's really nice. Doesn't matter um, with steel, you can design in any um, load combo that you want, um, it, whether ASD or LRFD. So no need to choose, they're both equal, um, and actually throughout the entire process, it's, it's equally broken down in both processes. So whatever you prefer, you can use. So that's really nice, as opposed to something like we talked about last time with uh, the wood design manual, you really wanna be doing um, ASD design, but um, we'll stick to talking about steel here. Um, yeah, and actually, so uh, the basically the capacity of your W section um, in flexure is, in short, um, is just um, your FY times your ZX. This is your plastic capacity again, um, equals, you know, Phi MN if you're doing LRFD. So FY is just your material grade like we talked about last time in, in your in your charts. Um, and oh, and excuse me, this is table three dash um, two. Section early section three, section three dash twenty five. Um, but anyway, your flexural plastic capacity is just FY times ZX. So FY, it's like a 50 KSI steel or 36 KSI steel. Um, if it's not, these tables are only good 50 KSI. So if you have a different capacity uh, or excuse me, a different steel material, these tables won't apply. So you got to be careful with that. You got to watch that. But most W sections, if not just about all of them is 50 KSI steel. So that's why they tabulated these formulas or tabulated these quantities. Um, for just a quick reference. Um, but what's actually nice, you might be seeing here, and you're like, oh, but we have all this, what's what's V, B, or V sub B, B, F, and what's L, L sub P, L sub R? You know, that starts to get um, a little strange. You're like, how do I even use those? I probably will never even need them or figure out what they're for. Um, I know that's what I thought in college, but um, a nice trick is, and I'll hold it steady on this, so you guys can either pause the video, Actually, I found this when I was studying, I um, can't remember when it was, but it was a nice little example of how to interpolate 
if your unbraced length, because um, your your capacity of your steel member and flexure changes as um, your unbraced length gets larger or shorter, because um, then you start to introduce you know uh, lateral torsional buckling or a couple of different um, modes of failure. Um, again, I'll talk about that uh, in some later episodes, but. Um, in short, what you can do is basically pause the video here, write this down as your example, but it's really nice how it relates those L sub P, L sub B, those are your unbraced lengths, um, and how to apply your BF, um, like we saw up in the tables up here. So it's how to apply these factors into an equation that then, based on your unbraced lengths and your, your span distances, that's your LB, is your span distance, and then your LP is your, um, uh, your unbraced length, then defines what your new moment capacity is. Um, and you'll see that if you derive, if your unbraced length is the same as your... Um, um, blanking out right now, um, as your uh, brace distance, then that just goes to zero. Um, so you would just, you'd have to use the, the uh, plastic section. Um, wait a minute, I'm totally spacing out here. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's consult the back here. Don't want to give you guys wrong info. Um, okay, and we'll go over this section on another video as well. But, um, Okay, so actually, excuse me, LB is your unbraced length. So that's the distance between your brace points, um, the longest one. So if you had, you know, a beam where there was, it was braced every two feet, but then there was a section of it that was braced four feet, you have to use that unbraced distance of four feet. So that's LB. And then LP and LR are your limiting lengths. Um, so that's what those are. And those are derived in the back. Um, you can derive them by hand in the back section. Um, that is under the flexural tab. And that is, as I flip here, in chapter F, design of members for flexure. So that you can do by hand and it goes really into depth about it. But you can either design or you can calculate LP by hand and LR by hand and then compare it to your unbraced length. Or you can go to your Z table. Now you're understanding why this table is kind of nice. And they have it tabulated here. Um, and LB is the only thing that would change because that's your unbraced length. So you plug those in to the equation here. And that will spit you out a reduced um, moment capacity of your W section. And similarly, if we keep going a little further here, another great section that I like that we use a lot is, that relates to the same thing, is your available moment versus your unbraced length for W sections. You've probably, you're gonna use this in, while studying in college, they're gonna, they're gonna um, put this on an exam, you're gonna have to know how to use it. This one is kind of messy. I still use it all the time, but I prefer going into that table and running that quick equation. Um, but this does the same thing. You have your capacities in ASD and LRFD on the left-hand side. You have 50 KSI steel, and you have, this is the cap moment capacity um, of your W section. And as it decreases, that's because your unbraced length is getting, on the x-axis, is getting larger and larger and larger which then pushes the slopes of these lines out this way. And each one of those lines is a member size. And that member size corresponds to its unbraced, or that member size and its capacity correlates to its unbraced length. So if you have uh, a W27 by 178, that's this dashed line, and it was had an unbraced length of 38 feet. Then you go 38 feet and you find it. Okay, W27.178, you come across. 
That's your available moment capacity in LRFD, and that's it in ASD. So that's use those tables, but all three of those are correlated. You can calculate it in the back, you can use these graphs, or you can use the Z table and use that equation. Once again, I'll zoom in one more time for you. Pause the video if you'd like to take that down. I'm not kidding. This is super, super helpful, as trivial as it is. Really helpful. And it's really nice that you can use this and compare it to these graphs because you will get the same answer. And if you don't, you've done something slightly wrong, and it would be a red flag for you to go back and check it out. Okay, so I spent more time there than I wanted to. Um, but I also want to point out things that I like are you have your weld symbols. So table 8-2 on page 8-35, you have your pre-qualified welding joints. And this gives you an understanding of all the symbols for welding. Um, believe it or not, although structural engineers are not you know, welders by any means. Um, we have to know a fair amount about welding and how to call out welds and size welds appropriately. And this gives you a real nice breakdown um, on welding, basically, and how to how to classify it and how to document it. Because um, there's some weird tricks in there that you need to start to learn about, where arrow direction and um, what side it comes from and what the different symbols mean. And it's very, very important. You're going to be... You're going to be using welds a lot when you get into the professional field. So I always refer back to this because I always forget sometimes with, with my different type of um, welds. The most common that you're going to be using, and in school particularly, is the fillet weld. That's like all the time. And funny enough, what I learned from a coworker and just like blew my mind is that the symbol is actually the shape of the weld. So, for instance, get my pen out. If you have, like, a steel plate and then you have another, let's make it two-dimensional. You have another steel plate coming in like this. The weld that you're going to use is a fillet weld, and that's on both sides, say. And that shape of the weld is literally, if I can have it focus here for you guys, is literally a little triangle. And that's the shape of the fillet weld. And that corresponds to all the rest of these. This is the actual shape between the pieces of steel coming together. So flare bevel, this is like if you had a steel plate. We'll draw it over here. If you had like a steel plate, and then you had like an HSS tube that you were welding to it, like that, you would call out a flare bevel right here. Because that's, here's your piece of pipe, or your rounded piece and your flat piece coming together. Flare V, it's two pipes being welded together. So a lot of that type of stuff, it, you never realize it until someone tells you and you're like, wow, if someone just told me that like years ago, this would be so much easier than trying to somehow remember these shapes and why they correspond to what they do. But it's literally the shape of the weld. There you go. Case closed. So, um, so yeah, uh, table 8-2, really helpful. I like it a lot. And then moving forward, it gets a little bit into CJPs and PJPs, but we won't talk about that today. Um, and then, oh, I know it's in here. Don't have it tabbed for you guys. Let's see, but in the beginning of this welding section, if I can flip my pages. Here we go. Page 8-8, your available strengths for welds. It breaks it down into two very simple equations for LRFD and for ASD. So again, page 8-8, weld strengths, right there. It's just um, a fact, or uh, yeah, a factor, um, which is broken down and explained above and how you derive that. Um, and then you have D, which is the weld size in sixteenths of an inch. So what that means is, because get ready for this, if you have, the trick is, say you call out a quarter inch weld, quarter inch equals 
Um, so what is that in sixteenths? Four sixteenths inch. So some people when they first start might say, okay, so D is four sixteenths. No, that's incorrect. D is four. It's the portion above the 16. So D is four. And then L is the length of your weld. And then you have, so, you know, you have a piece of steel and you have another piece of steel and you're going to weld it, you know, all the way along here. And that piece of steel is uh, 12 inches. That L is going to be 12. Um, and that's it. That's all it is. Um, it already has the fact your fee applied, your factor and your omega applied in there. Like I said, it's up above here is where it's really broken down, but this is what it quickly breaks down to. And the only reason it might change is your flux. Um, so in these broken down tables, it's for a flux of 70 KSI. And that's, that's the uh, type of flux is what they use in welding. It's the little tab um, that they use to complete the chemical reaction when they're welding two pieces of steel. Um, and that flux can be a different material grade. So 60, 70, 80, I, I'm not even sure what different kinds there are. I've basically only used 70 KSI. Um, but so that's very, very common. And if you have to call out something different, then you can't just use these two tables. You have to go to this tape, this equation of where it was derived from and change it. So that's all. And that's literally just your property in KSI plugged in here times 0.6. So that's it. And then the fee applied. So really helpful. Go here all the time as well. It's all I need to know for welds for the time being. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the last bit that I really like is I've tabbed section properties in, in table 17-27. And this breaks down all your really basic geometries and gives you that focus again for you guys. Uh, area, uh, your C, your I, um, your moment of inertia, your S, which is your plastic uh, or elastic section modulus, excuse me. And then you have your Z is your plastic section modulus and you have R. Um, so, and all of these are used in all the equations throughout the book because this is how you get your strength um, is your um, is your yield stress or whatever property it might be um, integrated through equations with your um, section property of your of your member, and that's where all of these come into play. So it's a quick back of the book flip to all of these equations to remind you um, how how to get your values for what geometry you're using. Um, and I use this all the time. E literally, even if it's not for steel, for wood, for any type of geometry, these equations are good for. Um, so I'm constantly back here. So it's just a quick reminder that even though this is the steel manual, um, I come in here a lot. Talked about it last time about your um, your tape or your excuse me. If we go all the way back, your shear moment diagrams and deflection diagrams. Use that all the time. So your section properties as well. Um, but until next time, that's it for today. Um, I hope you guys like this. Let me know. Please uh, like and subscribe. Um, and leave any comments for any questions you might have. This, this one was a little erratic, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, uh, any homework questions, anything like that, any test prep questions, let me know. And we can do something... Um, specifically tailored to your needs. But until next time, Kestava, see you later.